Something just happened about 10 minutes ago, and Tom Pelissero tweeted about it, and let's bring him in right now to kick off hour number three here on the Rich Eisen Show, uh, one of the NFL insiders and one of my uh, colleagues from the NFL Network and the NFL Media Group joining us right now in the aftermath of the benching of Bryce Young in favor of Andy Dalton just two games into his second season, the former first overall selection is only one twice and is now benched just two weeks into year number two. Tom is here on the Rich Eisen Show. Tom, I'll give you the floor on what happened. Rich, Dave Canales was adamant after the game yesterday, an ugly loss in the home opener. He kept saying, Bryce is our quarterback. Asked about whether he was going to remain the starter. Bryce is our quarterback. But my understanding is Dave Canales went back he looked at the tape last night. He came in the building this morning, had some further conversations. And Dave Canales made the decision, it's time. We need to do something different here. And that's why Andy Dalton now is going to be taking over as the starting quarterback. There are a lot of layers to a decision like this because you're talking about massive organizational change. Everybody knows the boatload that they gave up to go and get Bryce Young, albeit with a different head coach in Frank Reich, a different GM in Scott Fitter. But Dan Morgan, who is now the GM of the Panthers, was the assistant GM at the time. He was part of that decision. David Tepper was a part of that decision. It seems like it just boiled down to they couldn't go on like this. They couldn't continue to let Bryce Young go out there and get pounded the way that he did and have the offense unable to function the way that it was. Andy Dalton, at minimum, can operate the offense. He's 36 years old. He started like 150, 160 NFL games. You know what you're going to get from him. They feel like they had put more weapons around the quarterback position this year, not just in terms of trading for Deontay Johnson and you know drafting a running back in Jonathan Brooks, who we have not yet seen on the field. They've made other additions up front in terms of paying guards a lot of money. It was all built with give Bryce Young the best chance to succeed, but it still doesn't look right. And at this point, you know, when you're talking about being a first time head coach who's trying to maintain your credibility in the locker room, it would be hard for Dave Canales to look people in the eyes and say our best chance to win right now is with Bryce Young at quarterback. There's going to be a time and it's not that far away to talk about what this means for Bryce Young in the big picture of his career. Again, a player that this was not just Carolina, the consensus within the league was Bryce Young was the best quarterback in that 2023 NFL draft because of his accuracy, because of his work ethic, because of his processing ability, even though he didn't have the stature, even though he didn't have the big arm, the belief was all those other traits were going to give Bryce Young a really good chance to have success at the NFL level. That has not happened yet. And that's not to say somewhere down the line it hasn't happened. But you look around the league, Rich, at how quickly teams have pulled the plug on starting quarterbacks, whether that is the 49ers moving on from Trey Lance, the Jets from Zach Wilson, um, more recently, Justin Fields, obviously, the Bears moved on from him. Kenny Pickett got two years, not even, uh, before he ended up not being in the lineup down the stretch last year. As much as we can say, and there's truth to it, guys need time to develop. When it doesn't pass the eye test, and this entire Panthers team has not passed the eye test to this point this season, the one position where you can create a sea change is at quarterback. They're still really shorthanded on defense. They've still got issues they got to you know resolve as an offense here. But the one thing you could do to try to shake things up before the season really slides away from you is make a quarterback change. And so a very bold move by Dave Canales making that decision overnight and into earlier today. He informed the quarterbacks, Rich, a few minutes before I put the tweet out uh, that announced this news. You can imagine that this is a heartbreaking moment for Bryce Young. It's an opportunity for Andy Dalton, and there's no question it's a shakeup in Carolina. Well, I'm just looking here. Those are the only two quarterbacks on the, uh, on the, on the depth chart right now. I mean, they've got Louisville quarterback Jack Plummer, on the um, standout. is it right? I mean, he, he's a rookie. He, he's on the practice squad. I mean, is there any sense uh, of 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 just deactivating Bryce Young and and ha- literally having him removed from the equation uh, on a game day so he could just sit back and watch? Because let's say you know Dalton goes into Vegas, he gets dinged up by Max Crosby, which is by the right. way, or anybody else out there. It's not. A stretch, and then now all of a sudden you've got a benched Bryce Young out there trying his best to 
get back to what he once was at Alabama. I mean, so what what is the plan here with him and for how long will he be benched and how far down the depth chart might he wind? It's a great point, Rich. And also remember this, they're facing this team this week, a Raiders team that just beat the reigning NFL MVP and has a defensive coordinator in Patrick Graham, who is one of the hardest guys to game plan against in the NFL because of the volume of stuff he's throwing at him. So again, to put Andy Dalton, who at least has been there and he's seen it, it does make a, a sense at this point. It just it creates all these other effects in terms of what the number two position is going to be. There are veterans out there, you know, whether it's guys on practice squads like we saw the Dolphins uh, grab Snoop Huntley earlier today. There are guys on the street. I don't know that you want to go in with Jack Plummer as opposed to uh, yeah. Bryce Young here. Those are decisions that they're still going to have to make. What I can tell you is, again, Dave Canales made this decision. He watched the tape. It was based on what he was seeing on film. Dave Canales. Remember, Rich, he, he was hired with the idea this guy can get the best out of Bryce Young. And he went back to the basics and breaking down the footwork and, you know, trying to bring a positive energy that might have been lacking at times last year. So you could continue to, you know, kind of bang your head again against the wall on this thing and just hope it's going to get better. But when you're just seeing it be over somebody's head at this stage, you can understand where Dave Canales says, hey, right now we just got to win a game. We got to find a way to go and be competitive because they've been non-competitive. Derek Brown's not coming back. They've got a secondary that they basically claimed off waivers at the cutdown deadline. I mean, the Panthers have a lot of issues beyond the quarterback here, but at least by putting Andy Dalton in, it gives you a chance to go and try to function and run your offense here. Exactly what they do at number two, that remains to be seen. We saw Zach Wilson get demoted to number three uh, a couple of years ago here. It's certainly a consideration, but the big sea change today is what they've done at the quarterback position. And it's going to raise all kinds of other questions, Rich, too. And again, it's very early in the season. They're thinking, let's try to win some games, get this thing going the right direction. But if the Panthers now mm -hmm. have yet another high draft pick, you have to wonder, are we talking about the Panthers drafting a quarterback high again come 2025? Certainly if they wound up first overall, Tom. I mean, let's be honest here, because that's the conversation why I'm uh, I'm asking of how long is is this benching going to last? Now, obviously, that, that'll, that'll be determined by how Dalton performs uh, and how healthy he remains, as well as the concept of what's the metric by which they'll feel more comfortable letting Bryce Young back under center. And if that goes south, you know, in a half or a, th a third quarter or, or a game, the question is how, how much do they believe in him anymore? It, it's wild. Just for just, there's just, not uh, a lot of, right. There's not a lot of history of a franchise quarterback, much less a first round pick that you gave up as much as they did to go and get him has been benched and then come back and played well later. It's not totally unprecedented. We've seen other, you know, quarterbacks. I mean, Sam Darnold's an example right now, but that took six years and four different teams for him to start to, you know, be able to capitalize on the potential. You know, in these types of situations, you kind of have to weigh it out this way, I think, Rich, which is as much as Dave Canales, again, kept saying Bryce is our quarterback and you learn, right? You learn from these hard opportunities. There is a point at which you're not learning anymore. You're just getting your ass kicked. And Bryce Young and the Panthers were getting their ass kicked over the past couple of weeks and going through last season when they went 2-15 and 15 in his rookie year. That's That was always my concern with with Bryce Young was just the level of shrapnel that he was taking. And even though coming out of the firing mm. of Frank Reich 11 games in last year, you saw certain levels of improvements, but then you saw some backslide to it as well. And you bring in a new coaching staff and the results look the same. You know, we, we, it's too soon to say, you know, that the book is written on Bryce Young, but the first chapter of Bryce Young and the second chapter of Bryce Young in Carolina haven't been very good yet. There's going to have to be a pretty significant plot twist for this thing to work out for him in Carolina. Nobody could have thought going into the season we'd be two games in and talking about Bryce Young going to the bench. But that's exactly what the breaking news was this morning. Bryce Young is headed to the bench and Andy Dalton is going to be starting for Carolina week three at Vegas. Tom Pelissero here on the Rich Eisen Show. Let's talk about a couple more quarterback situations that – might be fluid or maybe not. The Steelers are 2-0. Um, Justin Fields hasn't lit up the scoreboard, but they're 2-0. and He hasn't made the mistakes. He did have an incredible throw to uh, George Pickens that got called back due to a hold. 
Um, but so he's shown flashes, and but they're two and zero. Oh. Is there is there a possibility that he's earned the job, and they'll just just let Russ try and get as healthy as possible in case he's needed, Tom? Well, I think that this is important to understand about the way that Russell Wilson is wired. This is a guy who, what, four or five years ago in Seattle, played one week after suffering an MCL sprain in one leg and a high ankle sprain in the other. He's always found ways to you know, come out and be the superhero and play through anything and you know make the most of it. Now he's in a place in Pittsburgh where – he's kind of being told we're not going to operate that way. Russell Wilson has told him for two straight weeks that he can play. He made a pitch in Atlanta in week one that he he can do this thing. He went through a pregame workout. Same thing, you know, going to Denver this past week, though I think at that point it was a little more apparent that he was not going to be in there. I would fully anticipate that Russell Wilson's going to continue to make that pitch. I'm healthy. I can go. I'm doing everything that you're asking me to do. But for Mike Tomlin, you know, he's watching them win games with Justin Fields playing much the same way that he was hoping Russell Wilson was going to be able to play. In other words, we haven't seen Justin Fields have the hellacious big play, the the eye-popping run. As you said, he had a couple of big plays, you know, that either got called back or something didn't go his way uh, in the game against Denver here. But more importantly, he's not turning over the football. He's not putting the ball in harm's way. He's running when he needs to. He's not taking the chances he's not supposed to. And I think realistically, when you're talking about one guy being early in his career and another guy being, what, 34 years old like Russell Wilson is, you probably say there might be a little bit more upside in Justin Fields. You know, there have been so many times when, you know, in the non-Ben Roethlisberger parts of this where Mike Tomlin has let guys basically hang on to the job until they throw it away. I mean, I was at a game, I want to say it was in Cleveland like four years ago, where you remember Devlin Duck Hodges was having a pretty good run and he was making some (laughs) plays, but then he got a little loose with the football. And I was told, hey, if, if Duck throws it away again, you know, he's probably getting benched in this game, but Mike wants to give him every opportunity to keep that job. And sure enough, Duck threw another one or two ducks and he was out of the lineup <laughs> in that game. Same thing last year with Kenny Pickett, who he was saying, hey, I'm fully healthy. And they were going, well, you know, still working your way back. We're going to stick with Mason Rudolph. Like that's like the organizational philosophy that encompasses the Steelers as a whole. It's, you know, people wanting Mike Tomlin. When are you going to make a move there? Well, Mike is competitive. He hasn't lost the room. I talked with Art Rooney about this this summer. Like, they're still gravitating toward him. They're still believing in him. And so we want to give him every opportunity to be that guy. When the entire world was calling for Matt Canada to be fired, it was Mike Tomlin who kept saying, we're staying the course until he got to a point where he felt like he could not do that. With Justin Fields, you're not being inundated with it's not good enough. It is good enough right now. And so I would not anticipate that he's going to put Russell Wilson back in simply because it's Russell Wilson's job. At this point, Russell Wilson never took a snap in a game, a regular season game for the Steelers here. And so let's continue to monitor how he refers to, you know, the position here. Let's, as Mike Tomlin would say, Rich, the participation will be their guide. As long as Russell Wilson remains limited in terms of the participation, there's probably not much of a conversation to be had in Mike Tomlin's mind, particularly when Fields is playing the way that he is. Let's talk Jordan Love. The uh, Packers got a win out of Malik Willis while Love is on the shelf. What do you have for me on on his readiness and how soon it might occur? Well, Matt LaFleur left the door open for Jordan Love to play last week, and that was not strictly gamesmanship from how I've understood it. There was certainly anticipation. Yeah, the MCL sprain is not an ideal injury. It's probably three to six weeks. They're hoping it's going to be on the earlier end of that here. But nobody would be surprised if Jordan Love manages to beat that timeline and get back onto the field. I give Matt LaFleur a ton of credit here because when you're talking about starting a quarterback who's coming from a little different style of offense and in college from Malik Willis was coming from Liberty where they didn't run anything that remotely resembled an NFL concept. And you're (laughs) telling me 20 days later at Lambeau Field, Malik Willis has to start the home opener for the Green Bay Packers. Like, that's an unfair, that is a tough position to put Malik Willis in. But from what I was told, and I talked about this with you yesterday on game day morning, Matt LaFleur, even while keeping the door open for Jordan Love, spent the week pumping up 
Malik Willis. And Willis said it in that post-game video in the locker room yesterday, like, hey, it helped build the confidence. Matt LaFleur told him all week, you can do this. You can, hey, whatever was happening in Tennessee, whatever you might have heard from Mike Vrabel over the last couple of years when you were falling down the depth chart and they're acquiring Josh Dobbs to start a must-win game at the end of the season, you're being demoted to number three. Hey, you can do this. We're going to find a way. And in the team meeting on Saturday night, Matt LaFleur gets up in front of the team and says, Malik, Everyone in this room has your bleeping back. That was the message, which was we're going to play complimentary football. The defense might have to make a play. The special teams might have to make a play. And lo and behold, not only do they play great complimentary football to beat the Colts, Malik Willis, when it came down to it, stepped up and made a couple of plays. He threw his first NFL touchdown over two years after he had that slide in the NFL draft, the only ball he didn't throw was the one that the center vomited on during the course of the game. <laughs> it's a really cool moment for Malik Willis. And it shows again, why guy in Matt LaFleur, who for whatever reason doesn't get respect, he doesn't win coach of the year. He's one of the best coaches that we've got in the NFL right now. And now potentially pending Jordan Love's status, Malik Willis might start against the Titans in his own revenge game in week three. So it's sooner rather than later for Love, right? That's why they didn't IR him. I mean, you're hearing you're hearing that it, it is possible Love comes back this week, Tom? I, I believe that Matt LaFleur will approach this the same way he did last week, which is if Jordan Love wakes up Friday, Saturday, Sunday and says, hey, I think I can do this, Jordan Love will have a chance to play. He's up to speed on the meetings and the call sheet and all that. You know, realistically, it's probably another week of Malik Willis, especially because, you know, this is going to be guided medically, of course, and the Packers historically are a pretty conservative medical team. But you also got a little more breathing room. If you're 0-2 right now, a little different conversation than, okay, we're 1-1. One one. Let's go in there and just try to play the same formula we're at, grind out another win. And then as we get toward, closer to probably week four, more likely week five, and Jordan Love might be back out there. Okay, um, let's uh, let's um, before we do a quick hitter and then send you on with your day because I notice your phone keeps blowing up, and I appreciate you. I, just... I appreciate you multitasking right now, Tom. <laughs> I understand what's going on. on. Right? I understand. No, 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 no. You're you're really you're really you're you're a multitasker. And it's not me asking for fantasy advice. I appreciate that because he's busy. Leave him, leave him alone. Uh, yeah, you can you can safely pick up Jahan Dotson now. I only got seven texts from you about that, Brockman. Oh my weekend. god! Pick I had to up. make sure. I, and I, and I added him yesterday. Sorry. Right. So we're friends. Uh, um, you were you were um, eloquent and uh, highly detailed in telling us what two is going to go through in terms of making a decision to to come back on the field. What is the latest uh, with that and the Dolphins uh, plan a quarterback right now, Tom? Tua is seen specialist this week, and like we discussed, there, there's so much data about Tua's brain because of the process he went through back in 2022. They're going to have ample information to guide him to make the best decision. It's going to come down to the health of his brain, the safety of his of him you know, coming back and playing NFL football. I don't believe there's really any question whether or not he's going to pass the NFL's protocols here, but they want to gather all the information uh, before they're making a decision. You know, they, they did add a quarterback today. They're signing Snoop Huntley off of the Ravens practice squad. They have not yet announced a corresponding move to open up the 53-man roster spot. At this point, it's not Tua going on IR. I know Mike McDaniel has said we don't want to put the added stress and the pressure of timelines onto uh, Tua Tunga Vailoa. If he were to go on IR, that would sideline him four games. Well, the Dolphins have three more games prior to their bye. Uh, this week's game is against Seattle. They've got two more and then the bye. So if you keep Tua on the active roster, and again, these are decisions they don't have to make till Saturday in order to free up the roster spot here. If you keep him on the active roster, then that raises the possibility maybe after the bye, potentially you could see Tua back on the field again that's getting ahead of ourselves because he's got to go through the medical portions of this but you know whether or not they put him on ir this saturday might give you a little bit of a clue at least in terms of what they're thinking is the soonest possibility of tua getting back on the field for now the plan is skylar thompson going to be the starting quarterback i thought it was very fascinating rich because there have been so many people speculating are they going to go get you know a cj bethard uh you know bring back ryan Tannehill, somebody who knows the system they've had a guy in tyler huntley who's not really been in this style of offense and also has a different skill set than what tua and skylar thompson does that makes me think 
You know, it's going to take some time here for him to get the entire system down. But you remember way back, 2008, the Cam Cameron Dolphins, when they went to Wildcat and just kind of came up with a different way to play. Maybe there's some things going in Mike McDaniel's brain that, hey, we don't have somebody as accurate, as good of a processor on this team with as much experience as Tua. Maybe we got some different plays and different things that we can put in having a quarterback you don't mind exposing in the run game. Again, I don't know that, Rich. I don't even think Snoop Putley is in the building yet. He literally just got signed off the practice squad this morning. But keep that in the back of your head. Is there a Snoop Huntley package? And depending on how things go with Skyler Huntley, could Snoop Huntley maybe even be an option to see a lot more time and even start as we get into week four, week five? Okay, finishing up, let's do some quick hitters on some uh, injuries, if you don't mind. Justin Jefferson, what's the scoop with his thigh injury? It sounds like it's not anything that's significant. It's a quad bruise, a quad contusion. Uh, Jefferson said after the game, he wasn't really concerned with it, though I did get a text. This is not from somebody with the Vikings, but a doctor with a different team who said, hey, don't underestimate those quad bruises because those things can swell up and be really painful in terms of could Jefferson be just in too much pain and have limited mobility where he can't go this week? That's something we'll monitor up until a game that suddenly looks like a pretty good one Sunday against the Texans. Pacheco, uh, is he going on IR with the broken fibula? Certainly seems like it's an IR situation. I know Rappaport reported this morning that uh, the belief is it's a fractured fibula. It's the third straight year where that type of tackle, and we'll see when the fines come out, whether they define this as a hip drop or not. But you remember Tony Pollard had a fractured fibula a couple of years ago. You had uh, Mark Andrews last year. Andrews had a cracked fibula and ligament damage that kept him out. It was around like two and a half, three months before he got back uh, right around, I believe it was the AFC championship game that he came back here. So a similar type of timeline, you're talking about most of the regular season, at least a couple months that Pacheco's missing. They've got, um, you know, the running back that they signed, uh, Samaje Pirine, after he got cut by the Broncos. Uh, you've got, you know, a couple other guys, Clyde Edwards, he layers out at least another couple of weeks on the NFI list here. There are some other backs that are potentially available as a guy they know really well, Kareem Hunt, who's still a free agent. Mm. You got, you know, guys like Dalvin Cook, who's on the practice squad in Dallas. We'll see exactly what they decide to do uh, moving forward here, but would not be a surprise if they added backs. Pacheco's going to be out a while. All right. Uh, and speaking of hip drop tackle, certainly like Joe Mixon was a uh, subject to that. What's his what's his ankle? looking like today best you can tell yeah, Joe, Joe Mixon made that uh clear in no uncertain terms on social media last night that he would like something to happen to TJ Edwards uh for that tackle uh you know I checked on it it it's unclear yet whether or not that's a high ankle sprain or a low sprain what I can tell you he's having an MRI today you know he got twisted up pretty good Texans are also short because remember Damian Pierce wasn't even active last night they've got Cam Akers after two Achilles tears that's a cool story um, but they potentially could be in the market to have to add a back as well depending on uh, exactly what that MRI shows with Mixon two more Cooper Cup left with a uh, left with a, a walking boot on in Arizona What's his deal? The, the Rams are the walking wounded right. right now between their wide receiver group and the offensive line group. Test today uh, for Cooper Cup. We know Puka is not going to be back for probably six weeks or so. Uh, their buy is coming up. They're, they're one of the rare teams. A lot of coaches like to have the buy in the middle or at the end. The Rams are the rare team where I think they have a week six buy. That might be the best thing possible here just to try to get some guys healthy. Remember, too, um, they have their two suspensions that expire today. So Jimmy Garoppolo can come back, be the two, and Alaric Jackson. Jackson, who also was suspended for two games, will be back. We'll see what those tests end up show, showing with Cooper Cup, but at least the offensive line getting somebody because they've lost a lot of dudes on that unit. And then lastly, uh, Jermaine Johnson of the Jets popped his Achilles. Does this mean movement with the Hassan Reddick holdout? What? That was one of the many texts that I got uh, while we were talking here, yes. Rich. Does not sound like the stance for the Jets has changed, even wow. with Jermaine Johnson tearing the Achilles. Hassan Reddick has given up. I mean, the running tally is, you know, seven, eight million dollars at this point. He's losing eight hundred thousand dollars for every game he misses. He had all the fines uh, back in camp. And it's just the, the you know, the tally is going to continue to go up here now. At some point before the trade deadline, which is November 5th, the date that, as I keep saying, you know only, you know, for no other reason than the fact that it's the trade deadline, uh, they're going to have to make some decisions here. You know, Reddick is either going to have to decide where to show up, potentially have his contract toll if he does not show up, or the Jets would have to decide, you know, we're – we've had enough and we're going to, you know, try to recoup some level of a pick. They're not going to get the third back because all of a sudden now you're talking about getting Hassan Reddick for eight, nine games – 
instead of getting them for a full season, unless you can agree to a contract extension, which what team signing a, a 30 year old pass rusher to a contract extension in the middle of a season where you don't even know what type of shape he's in for the rest of this year. It, it's complicated. I, I don't think that anybody is advising Hassan Reddick to stay out. Certainly not his agent, Tory Dandy, who's never been a believer in, you know, giving up money that you can't get back. Um, and so for Hassan Reddick, he's, he's ultimately going to have to make a decision. Does he want to make football? Does he want to continue to stand on pride and miss $800,000 in paychecks per week? You know, that, that pot of gold is not at the end of the rainbow for him right now. I don't think that any of us would ever hold it against somebody. Hey, you're holding out to get your money. Great. But this is the rare holdout where that money's not out there. It's it's not coming right now. The best thing you can do is probably get on the field, show that you're a great pass rusher, and then get back and get that money in March. That's just not where Hassan Reddick is at at this point. So it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot going on on that front yet. Tom, you the man. Really appreciate your time. Apologize for Brockman blowing you up about Jahan Dotson. <laughs> My goodness gracious. What a waste of your time. AJ's still out. AJ's still out. Hey, right. Tom, hey, Rich, Thank you. Before, Thanks, Tom. Before we let Tom go, Tom, Rich, this weekend watched a great movie for the first time, the original Beetlejuice. So I was just wondering, what's uh, what, what's the response? What you think? Just only say it one more time, Tom. It's been said once yeah, already. Yeah, be, yeah, careful. So don't, so be, be careful. Be careful. I got about 25 minutes into uh, Beetlejuice. Oh. And so I know you're not supposed to say it the third time. So at this point, all I've seen him is re- of him is reading a newspaper from the back. And so I'm still waiting. I'm going to get there, TJ, within before I see it. you guys, before I'm out there in like two weeks. He's I busy. promise I will finish the He's movie. Busy. I'll have the full review ready. Dude bet, keeps bet. looking at his phone, and we're out of time, too. Ah, Thanks, Tom. Right. Appreciate right. it. That's Tom Posara right, right here on The Rich Eisen Show. Catch The Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.